And with that, we, it is now time for our first uh, keynote, or an only keynote today. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Alicia uh, Seidel, who is the Executive Director of the Open Source Hardware Association. She's gonna be talking to us about how open source hardware works and how those communities are built. And we are very happy to have her with us on the stage today. So please welcome. Okay, so as mentioned, my name is Alicia Seidel. Um, if you see me on the internet, and I look like this, but my name is Alicia Gibb, I am the same person, just to let you all know. Um, I am the executive director of the Open Source Hardware Association. We have been around for about 12 years now. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we deal all in hardware. So I want to tell you first a little bit about where I come from. So my, uh, one of my degrees is in library and information science, and I come from the library world. And in library school, they taught us that you could right click on a website and view the source. And I was in library school because I care about freedom of information and access to information. That's why I became a librarian. And when I learned that you could right click and view that source, I was like, this is freedom of information. This is access to information. I was really excited. So that kind of got me down the open source code path. And then, my other degree is in art history. And what I learned from art over the decades, maybe this is a very uh, famous painting here on well, your left, right? Da Vinci's Mona Lisa. And on the right, also a very famous painting um, called L-H-O-O-Q. And uh, this is by And so, two paintings that look very similar, but clearly one is a derivative of the other, right? When you are in art, and when you're in art history, you very quickly learn that the way to become a good artist is to copy the greats, to see if you can be, you know, be as close to their techniques as possible. And then, you know, because a lot of like art has happened for so long, not only can you copy the grades, but most of the stuff is like, you know, totally in the public domain, so you can also make fun of it, you can do whatever you want with it, you can print t-shirts with it, right? Makes, makes for a lot of fun in the art world. And then I want to tell you a little bit about where open hardware's come from. So I always make a point to um, talk about how Oshawa didn't start the open hardware movement. It existed long before us. Um, what we did is kind of coalesce the community and we became stewards of the community, stewards of the definition. So in 1997 was the first time that we could find that people started talking about open hardware and created an open hardware certificate program. There were licenses that came before us. Um, there was uh, um, uh, um, Bruce Perrins, who's you know, in the open source software industry who created the Tapper license. But it's really specific to ham radio. Um, and kind of once you got really into different types of hardware, it didn't quite work as planned. Uh, Ohana created a licensing structure that hinged on trademark. Um, and then 2010 came along, and there's a bunch of companies doing open source hardware. And we realized, you know what would be great is if when we set open source hardware, we were all talking about the same thing. So. We did what any good little community does in open source. We started a mailing list. And then um, we got a group of people together and started working on this definition. We created this communal little gear logo, which you may see um, all around the open hardware world. Um, CERN came in, like Large Hadron Collider CERN, like Switzerland CERN, that CERN. They came in and created an open hardware license, um, which I thought was really awesome because they were you know, a huge entity that's not going anywhere anytime soon, um, creating one of our licenses based on our community definition. Um, so in 2012, Oshawa formed. We wrote some best practices. There was a book published. There was all kinds of, you know, events that we had. Um, we had the Open Hardware Summit, which we've had annually um, since 2010. 
Um, we went to the White House. We have a certification program that launched that I'm going to talk about. Um, so there's been a lot of movement, and then um, I've you know been lax in updating this slide even since four years ago. So on my to-do list. <laughs> <clears throat> And then I want to give you a brief history of intellectual property. So, again, stemming from my art history background, um, these are triangular structures on different continents around the globe, created at different times. Some of them created around the same time in the grand scheme of things. But I always like pointing this out because on all these different continents, when travel wasn't really happening, they came up with the exact same structure, right? They came up with this sort of pyramidal sort of structure, you know, usually around some kind of like religious ceremony type thing. Um, and, and it's always like, you know, the base pyramid going up to the heavens or the skies or whatever your religion had a being sun. Um, and so I think this is really fascinating. So what this tells me is that people can't make the same things without infringing on your patent on purpose, right? People will constantly create, we see this also in my mother background, I see this a lot with folklore and fairy tales. We've got Cinderella stories from all kinds of different continents on the globe, lots of different countries, lots of different cultures. It doesn't mean that any one of them specifically copied the other, it just means that we were all trying to tell our children how to be safe and get home at midnight, right? So this is kind of like usually my um, sort of my my, my go-to slide to let everybody in the world know that it is okay and people don't always need to infringe when they create the same thing. And that's been happening for centuries. All right. So what defines open source hardware? Open source hardware means you can remix, remake, remanufacture, resell redistribute and study and learn from the source files. Now I think resell is a really interesting one that kind of differentiates hardware a little bit. Because we deal in atoms rather than bits, those atoms do cost money to mine from the ground, right? Nobody expects that if you get, you know, a, a piece of electronics that that should be free. Um, so people are willing to pay money for open source hardware and that is how most of the open source hardware companies survive is by selling their stuff. All right, now what is the source when it comes to atoms rather than bits? So the source is really, of course, anything needed for somebody to make a copy. So this might look like schematics, CAD files, code, firmware, hand drawings, right? There's a hand drawing sort of a computer drawing of the um, University of Wisconsin's open source space shield. Um, and so none of that has anything to do with software, right? That's all atoms and no bits. So, so kind of a divergence of open source software there. Uh, this face shield also got taken up by Ford and made in the millions during the pandemic. And I haven't been able to actually get in contact with the folks from the University of Wisconsin who were on the team that dealt with it. Like, the lawyers, or maybe if you didn't deal with the lawyers at Ford, right? But if you can take something, if you're in an emergency situation around the globe, and you can take something without worrying about the licensing fees, the legal ramifications of reproducing that really quickly, can you imagine how long it would have taken for Ford's lawyers and the university's lawyers to like hash out a deal? We would have like, you know, been in year 2026 of COVID. Um, so all these things are copyrightable. Right? Basically, our source, even though it's hardware, and hardware being patentable, all of the source things are all copyrightable. So if you put your source you know, out there on the internet, where the public is, and it's available, then you can apply for the open source hardware certification. And what this certification does is it creates validity that somebody has double checked and made sure that all your files were there and that yes, indeed, you had enough of the files that somebody could reproduce this thing. Um, and then they give you a special number. We give you, we let you use our logo. This is our trademark um, certification logo here. And you get a country code and an ID number, and that is special to you. 
and you get to put that on your product and say, yes, my thing is open source hardware, it has been checked, and you can rest assured that if we have um, a country code and a number, that you will be able to find that source in our database. And this is our database. Um, this number is a little old. We have over 2,800 projects now. Um, but this is a lot of um, different types of projects um, from around the world that are all open source hardware, right? So we have a database. It's not a repo. It's not GitHub for hardware. As much as we would all love that, uh, we are a small organization. And so we're still waiting for somebody to build that. Uh, but for now, this is a database, and it links out to everybody's um, file system, different types of file systems um, that they have for their hardware. Now, we started in the electronics industry, and um, that's kind of how we grew, and then we kind of grew into 3D printing. And then, because hardware is anything in, rather, in, uh, with atoms rather than bits, we ended up getting perfume as open source hardware. We had to certify a hammock, jewelry, crochet projects, tractors, and then a group came together and said, hey, we're medics in Canada, and we want to certify our open source hardware aircraft. We don't quite know how to do that, though. And so you I'm saying, like, okay, what on earth is the source for perfume? What is the source for a tractor, for a crochet project, right? Any kind of a crochet project, right? Um, but aircraft? So the group, they got together to kind of try to figure out how on earth to open source an aircraft. Ended up determining that there were so many parts and pieces to that source and the software, or the, I don't know if it's really software, it's like the, the platform, the documentation platform to create an aircraft is um, so enormous and extraordinarily expensive. They kind of scrapped the project for now of open sourcing it because it was just sort of like, well, if you need to be a multi-million dollar company to even view the source, and to even like, like, is that really open source then? I kind of felt like, well, that's really asking a lot of the user and kind of obfuscating the term open source if nobody can really, you know, look at the design files because they don't have the platform. Um, but yeah, so we have started dealing with all kinds of uh, issues <laughs> within Atoms. Um, and if it seems like, when you go and read our definition, we're a little ambiguous about what your source is. This is why. We can't simply say the source must be your firmware and your code and your schematics and some board files, um, because that doesn't work for a lot of these things, right? A lot of these things don't have firmware or board files, and they have different kinds of source. So we are sort of ambiguous on purpose about what source is, um, because it is different for every project, as we've discovered. By the way, does anybody know what Adam I put up there? Nobody? What? No. Wait, I think I heard it over there. Carbon, good job. Nice, nice work, everyone. Y'all like went to chemistry page. That's good. Okay, so. I'm going to switch a little bit to communities, right? So that's a little bit about open hardware. So now we're going to talk a little bit about um, the open hardware community. And um, I started uh, talking about, so one of my other degrees is in education. That's how I started out. I thought I would be a teacher. I thought I was going to be an art teacher. Um, and then it turned out that art nowadays was like recess. And I was like, whoa, like that is, it was a little too much. So um, I ended up, you know, over here in tech. Um, but what I took from the education world was um, how to teach kids about kindergarten rules, right? And in kindergarten, one of like the basic rules is sharing, 
right? And so this is kind of what we do in open source communities and in open source in general, right? We share, we're transparent, put our stuff out there for other people to use. So I kind of made my own uh, um, sort of derivative of Robert Coven's kindergarten book. Um, so in open source hardware, at least in our community, when we, mean sh when we say share everything, we mean your source, right? Which is more or less everything, at least to, um, to create your hardware. Um, this is the board file for the, for the Beagle Bone Playfair. And what this means to us is follow the definition and any applied licenses, right? So we have a number of different licenses that have to sort of happen on top of our software licenses, there's documentation, there's hardware, right? Now, hardware is a super weird, interesting thing to license because actually, hardware is born free, right? So, hardware, it's, it's, you know, when you write software, the software is automatically copyrighted to you. Hardware is not locked down until something that was patented. So, hardware is born free, and really what we're doing when we call hardware, open source hardware, we are sharing our intention. We are saying yes, we understand that it's born free, but our intention is really to open source it. It is okay if you take it and copy it and modify it and do whatever you want with it. So instead of kind of saying like, oh yeah, we put the source out there, but like, we don't really need you to copy it, right? We're being like really upfront about our intention. We want to make sure that people know that we meant it to be open source. So, with that, we don't really have a way around um, the patent industry, right? Like with the USPTO and whatnot, because you can just toss your hardware out there and it's free until you patent it, right? So it's kind of like we don't have this world of necessarily like copyleft licenses, Creative Commons licenses, or whatever, because it is um, automatically like not locked down. So that's kind of interesting. So what happened then was my friends over at CERN, right, also were like, hey, but we really want intention on the hardware license. And we want to say if it's permissive, if it's viral, if it's like whatever it is, we really want a little bit more um, sort of attributes to that license, right? And there would be a way to make this like work within the patent system, but it would make everybody go and get that patent. And for an open hardware community, a lot of our businesses are small. Um, and even the ones that aren't, right? A lot of our businesses would rather give money to R&D to further their hardware than give money to their legal team to go write a patent. Patents roughly when you consider the application fees and the time of a lawyer and the time of your engineers, roughly cost about $50,000. And that's, you, you might not even get it, right? They might say, oh, we want some prior error, here you go. You don't get that pack, but you don't get that money back. So um, our community really doesn't want to go the route of, we'll go get patents, and then we'll license those patents in a way that's like, you know, this, is, this would be the typical way that the courts would like totally understand and would realize exactly what we're trying to do. So instead, we said, okay, let's try to come up with some like bizarro land, you know, open hardware licenses that maybe or maybe not the patent world and the courts might understand or might not, right? So we're kind of trying to go off of really the foundations that open source software has built and leverage those foundations and apply it to open source hardware and kind of hope that it works. And the exciting thing is we actually come back to that indeed it does work um, because of the concept of prior art, really. So prior art means that um, when you build a piece of hardware and you throw it over the wall, right, you make it public, that um, as long as that's publicly available, that if somebody else comes along and tries to patent, they should not, in theory, be able to patent because your prior art is already out there. There was a 3D printer, it was a hang printer that was developed, and a couple years ago, somebody patented the 3D printer printer. And in their patent, they even referenced the original open source hardware design. 
as saying like, yeah, this is from that person, right? Um, and so they got the patent because also the USPTO is kind of, um, you know, they're, I feel for them, right? They're under-resourced, they're understaffed. And so their job is just to like put out as many patents as they can. And the problem is if those patents come back, then they have to do all that work again. So it's kind of easier for them to just give you a patent. So the patent was awarded to the person who was not the open hardware creator of the hand printer um, and started a um, crowdfunding campaign for legal fees <laughs> to fight that patent. And the open hardware creator who originally um, created the hand printer appealed to the patent office and won. So we saw that the system actually does work for open hardware. Um, when a patent was awarded incorrectly, he was able to say, hey, this is my prior art, and this is open source, and I intended this to be open source, and I have these licenses on it. And um, yeah, and so the patent was revoked, um, and it is a fully open source hardware thing, once again, with no patents around it from anybody else. All right. So that's playing fair. Don't hit people. Yeah. Success. <laughs> Big fans of hang printers in this room. OK, so don't hit people, right? What I mean by this, and I know I have one of your sponsors. I'm sorry. This is, um, so this is Apple's patent, to pant, patent rounded corners. Now, I want to show of hands. Who in kindergarten drew a rounded corner? <laughs> Brilliant. I can tell this is a room of like really smart people. Some of the five rooms around rounded corners. This is amazing. So, yeah, so, so, and then they like sued, uh, you know, a bunch of other phones out there that had rounded corners. And it was kind of like, oh, wait, wait, wait. what, like in the landscape of intellectual property, which was designed to move innovation forward, how does that really move innovation forward, right? That's just kind of, you know, utilizing uh, the patent system for, like, for your war chest, right, as they say. So that's what I mean by don't hit people. It's kind of like, hey, play nice in this open source world and don't pat around the corners, please. <laughs> um, okay, there's a rule in kindergarten about putting things back where you found them. Um, so this is uh, what I consider an intentional hardware creation. Like, share like and share like is due. Right? So um, if, if they have a license that says, hey, share this alike, you better follow that license and share it alike. And the cool thing about licenses is they have legal teeth, right? So you can make people share alike if that's what you put on there. Um, I will say this is a really interesting um, thing about hardware. And I'm interested to know what happens in the software industry is, so this is the microcontroller here on your left. Um, and the little pattern we know on the right. And I think this shows you also the power of derivatives. So the original Arduino team was trying to make a um, microcontroller, right? Typical microcontroller. They were making it um, for artists and designers to use, a language that artists and designers would kind of understand. Um, they made it pretty. Um, they they uh, put, a, put a USB port on it when like, microcontrollers did not have a USB port, so it was not just like an easy plug and play device. They created an IDE around it. They created a community around it, right? They did a bunch of things. What they were probably never going to do was come up with a version that could be sun and flow. That's just like not in their radar, right? And that is the beauty of like open sourcing something is that now there's a whole bunch of people who um, you know, were really into sewing or costumes or whatever, who came over into this whole Arduino world because they found a microcontroller you could sew and make things blink and light up and whatever. Um, and so sometimes when people are like, oh, I want to open source my thing, but like, you know, then I'll be missing out on part of my community. And I say, no, actually, you might be allowing more communities to come in who you wouldn't have thought of otherwise. Um, and I think the Arduino, uh, the lily pad is a perfect example of that. Now, with the lily pad, this is kind of what I want to know. So, the lily pad, as you notice, is called the lily pad arena. 
And that is because we have the integrated world of that arena. Um, license the trademark from Arduino pays like you know a small fee back with every board sale, right? So, um, so that trademark or that means that she gets to use the Arduino trademark, right? Where other boards um, don't necessarily get to use that trademark. And so I'm kind of curious, like, does that happen where people are using like the Apache trademark all over the place? Or, like, how does that work within your world? I'm curious about that. Um, we'll have like a Q&A, and it can be like a comment and a also, where like you just like tell me. <laughs> um, okay, so this, this slide is clean up your own mess, and don't blame your business problems on it being open source, because that's really, rarely the case. And I actually, in hardware, I have yet to see that be the case again, in terms of comments. You know, please let me know. Right, but like, whenever um, companies come and tell me, they're like, oh yeah, I have this problem, I have, this open source hardware, my problem is like, I can't like hire the right kind of person. I'm like, well, that's just a business problem. That has nothing to do with open source, right? Or they come and say, oh, like, yeah, I've got like this, you know, supply chain problem or whatever, right? And it's like, okay, well, that's a supply chain problem. It's a business problem. That's not really an open hardware problem. But one that people love to bring up is like, yeah, but if you open source your thing, then you're like, you know, gonna like, get copied, which, you know, we're okay with and whatnot, but, you know, people steal your trademark, and people do this, and people do that in terms of your intellectual property and whatever. Um, but here's the thing is, even when you have a patent, people still will take that hardware and copy it and modify it and things like that. Um, if you know the slanket, a patented blanket with arms, there is also a snuggie. <coughs> Right? Another blanket with arms, also patented. Um, so it doesn't really matter, like, even if you get a patent, you have to, like, go to court and, like, litigate and all this other stuff. Um, so even if you have, like, open source that people are, like, you know, incorrectly, they're, like, locking down or not giving attribution or whatever, like, that also happens within the patent world. And so I think that's also really important for us to understand when we're talking about harder businesses. Um, but yeah, so I have yet to see the case of, like, you know, business problems being open source. Um, don't take things that aren't yours, right? So give attribution if it's required, and it almost always is, but be careful not to encourage on the trademarks. And again, this is like huge in the hardware community. We had to do a lot of um, education around like, yeah, you can totally copy that board, but you can't copy the company's trademark, right? And I think one of the things um, that's a little different about hardware software um, in the open source landscape is that open source software, right? If you have all these like communities who kind of operate under like a 501c3 or some kind of nonprofit business or a 501c6, um, who and the software is built within that nonprofit, right? And in the hardware world, it's a bunch of companies, right? We actually have no hands on any development at the sort of nonprofit that's running this community. Um, we don't do anything in terms of development with products. Um, and I think the IRS would actually get kind of upset with us if we did, because everybody is selling these products for a profit, right? They need to be a business. And so we have all these businesses out there who, um, who are really depending on their trademark to make their business viable and to tell the consumer, hey, yeah, to consumer, when you buy this thing, this is coming from this company, that's the company to call for support. That's the company that, like, you know, you can return your product to when it doesn't work. Um, but there's definitely been um, issues where, you know, because it's open hardware, people just say, like, cool, I'll just take it, copy the whole thing, right? Even the trademark. Um, and so, you know, you have to, like, get on the phone and be like, hey, so, like, that's my trademark, right, as a business. And, and um, I'd really appreciate it if you didn't copy that trademark and if you could maybe take that off your board and whatever. And so, you know, people typically comply. Um, a lot of times what we found is like they don't mean to do it wrong. It just takes a lot of education on like how to do it right. You know, there's a lot of, um, and that's our role, right? So we do education for the community outreach um, and kind of try to get everybody on the same page about what right means. 
Um, and then say sorry when you hurt somebody, right? This is kind of what I was just talking about. So instead of the meeting was like, oh, like it's not even a trademark, right? It's a lot better to just send an email to hey, I don't, I don't know if you realize this, but I think you copied my trademark, right? So leading with empathy and kindness gets you a lot further than like assuming that everybody is like trying to, um, you know, take your stuff and use it incorrectly or that people are acting with a nefarious cause. From what we've really found, that's not the case and, and people are actually just being people and trying their best, um, but we're all human, so we make mistakes. So when you lead your community with empathy and kindness, it really goes a long way. And then warm cookies and cold milk are good for you. Um, this is a good rule. I think like this, this totally sums up that Robert Plunkett like, wrote his book in the 70s, right? When like kids are still getting cookies at school. Um, but it's a to transform your community, right? So like, um, we live in a different age now, and one of the ways that you can welcome your community is making sure that you've got a plethora of different options um, in terms of food of the kind. Those have welcoming signals, right? Um, and lots of there's a, lots of other ways to welcome your com or your community as well, of course. Um, and then finally, when you go into the world, watch for traffic, hold hands, and stick together. Right. So community is vital to open hardware. As I'm sure you all know, it's vital to open software. Like this is the model that we have copied, the open source wonderful model that we have copied from the software community, um, being that hardware came a few decades after software. Um, but yeah, having your community, of course, and, and having your community thrive is also really important. And so doing all these things to create a nice, welcoming community um, is really important for hardware, as I'm sure it is for software. And then the ways to engage with Asha. So you can connect to us on social media. You can join our Discord or Axter community. Uh, Axter is um, one of the platforms where you can like, put out your instructions of how to make something. Um, you can certify your open hardware, of course, if you're building hardware. You can participate in Open Hardware Month, which is October. Um, we just had a 24-hour show and tell. Um, but luckily, I didn't do it. I think I still did the thing. <laughs> Um, but we'll have all those videos online if you're curious to know more about this first record or want to see some projects in the community. Um, you can become a member, of course, make a donation for a free. Or, also, we just got this NSF grant from the National Science Foundation, right, NSF, um, to think about how medical devices can be open source hardware. Um, that is one of the things that is very good done. Um, we started seeing people certifying medical devices, and we were like, whoa, <laughs> again, those ads. It's hard to keep in check. We were like, what does that mean? And what does it mean if they have FDA compliance? What does it mean if they have a, this thing called 501k that I'm still like wondering about? Um, but yeah, I would love to talk to anybody who um, has ideas about open hardware medical devices or um, who maybe has created one or has thought about it, um, and who is interested in what it means to have a community around your healthcare. Um, so my email is at the bottom there. And also, like, if you have other, other things, like just general community, you know, things to tell me, tips and tricks, nonprofit tips and tricks, I'm so open to all of that. I uh, nearly got in trouble like, a few times because of the things that I didn't know I didn't know. So if you know what is coming next for me that I don't know, please tell me. <laughs> um, so yeah, my email is at the bottom and like our base URL is asha.org. So you can reach me there. I'll be around for coffee. And then also we have our Q&A session. Um, so you can ask me whatever you want right now. Or you can tell me things too. Like, hey, I have this medical device and it's open source. It was like totally dollar or not the work, you know, you can tell me all kinds of It's a common question, answer, a part of answer, right? Anyone have curiosities? Um, does Joshua extend to food? Like, can I open source a recipe that they can make yeah. yeah, 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 so no, um, that's, yeah, so the atoms rather than this, so the short answer is yes. 
We have not certified any food yet, but that's a, that's a great point. Certified chocolate chip cookies for sure. I might have to, might have to make a recipe. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think that one of the things that, you know, that's interesting to me in the food industry, and so the other thing is that we have certified a lot of farming devices and different kinds of farming things that help foods grow. And I think as we're all watching this whole you know, global warming thing and like how do we get food for all these people on our planet and all this stuff, I think that that is like kind of a, one of the vital pieces of our work that's going to like play a huge role, especially like vital humans. Um, but also as we're like seeing various dietary restrictions and like different things kind of popping up and like, hey, what does healthy mean now? And you know, I, it wouldn't surprise me at all if we get like open source food on a relatively short, um, cycle here. Mm -hmm. What's the plan for open source medicine? Yes. Okay, so the plan for open source medicine. There's a couple things. This blew my mind. I was up in London, Ontario last semester um, where I learned insulin was created. Insulin, the guy who created it, said this is life saving medicine. This should always be available for anybody who needs it. I am going to sell the pet for one dollar. Right? What's happened to insulin in the United States? Like, it's cost prohibitive for a lot of people. It's insane. There are, um, this is kind of sad, but there are diets that people do um, as a way of uh, protesting the insulin prices, right? So they like, oh, yeah, they're not going to be dead. Um, because, like, it is, like, the patent industry on insulin, so in the United States, you know, right, because, so patents are also geographical, so you can get a patent in Canada and you can sell for a dollar. Doesn't mean patent is, has anything to do with the United States, right? So somebody else in the United States can get a patent, and like, and here's what insulin is doing, has been um, changing the um, inactive ingredients. So not the things that make insulin work, but the inactive ingredients. Since, I want to say it was like 1920 or 30, like a really long time ago, right? Patents are supposed to be um, about roughly 17 to 20 years depending on your type of patent. And then it's supposed to go into the public domain because patents were supposed to spur innovation. Okay? So we have insulin that just keeps changing to inactive ingredients and then applying for new patents. So it's still patented. And it's patented by mostly two companies. Um, two companies can go back and forth about it. Um, and, and what that does is just drives up the price, right? Because there is no generic, there's no, like, there's, there's just sort of no way out, right? But there is the Open Insulin Project, and they are trying to create open source insulin as hardware. Um, but I am really interested to talk to them because I want to know. I don't know, you know, sometimes it's hard because like, they don't want to tell you either. <laughs> but I want to know, like, what has your patent been? Have these medical companies tried to, like, take you down, right? Um, similarly, the Chan Zuckerberg Institute, which is the ads like that, Zuckerberg, um, they were working, they had something like $100 million because they wanted to open source vaccines in, like, over the next few years or something. So they've got a department. Working on that, which I think is also really interesting. But as far as medicine goes, right, we have a mixed e for it. It's called a generic. You know, it's effectively open source medicine. Yeah. Question right there. So, this is me and Theo, and you just want to like, uh, is there any art that's been open source to your organization yet? Like, kind of the soul a little bit kind of stuff, or making instructions to create the artwork? Yes, there is a ton of open source art um, in the hardware community. A lot of it is what I would consider like electronic art, right? Or like new, um, sort of like extraordinarily contemporary art. But yeah, even um, Meow Wolf, which is here in Denver, their um, Meow Wolf's CTO actually was like really interested in um, open sourcing a bunch of their art and a bunch of like how they do their things so they've got a whole key on it. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of people create open source art, a lot of uh, certifications um, are for open source art. I don't know if we have an actual category that is art. I can't remember all the categories at the top of my head. There is. There is. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so we didn't have a category for it. Yeah. There's another question. Um, one of the 
other things about it, just to follow up on the medicine also, is like one of the things like I've been thinking about in terms of medical devices is that I was like, okay, I could certify like a face mask, right, and a face shield, like something on the exterior of the body, like prosthetics, right? All these things, people are already personalizing them and doing all the source and whatever. So like I was like, I could understand on the outside of the body how that would work. Now the inside of the body kind of terrified me. And then we started talking to people about this whole medical device thing. And I talked to the NIH, the National Institute of Health. And they said, yeah, we have this problem that companies, startups in particular, that make implantable devices, they get them through the FDA, that implant them in people and then go out of business. We need that source. We need open source implantable devices so that when the company goes out of business, their doctor can still care for them. And I was like, oh, right, like this thing I was so afraid of open sourcing. Yeah, like, I guess we should be thinking about open source and fundamental devices. And there are actually a couple open source um, devices, hardware devices that are going to be implantable. Um, one of them has gotten FDA approval, one of them has not. Um, but uh, they're both in the research category, right? So these are like for like, doctors to do research around and not to use yet, but hold on. Any other questions or comments? Does anybody have any tips for me about communities or? Hi, I've So our membership, uh, we rely on because they vote in our board. Um, and our board, so like, you know, we're like, open source, hey, like, let's have a democracy. Um, so we have to have a member system so that you have a democracy, right? So our member system is that um, you, you pay, and we've got like a sliding scale of all kinds of different membership levels. Um, don't worry, we get the stickers with every member level. Um, and so you can become a member um, on our website, it's like after.org, probably slash member. And um, you basically make a, a, a donation, your, your membership is um, tax deductible. And then you get our undying love, as well as the ability to vote in our board members. Um, and then, you know, every once in a while, you like, you know, ask you to be on a mailing list. It's really interesting, though, being an open source nonprofit, right? Because you don't like obfuscate anything, like, there's nothing like, you know, enormously special for your members that you're getting by being a member that like, the whole public doesn't also get, right? Because you're open source. So it's like, it's really hard. So typically what we really leverage it is just um, philanthropy of our, our people, right, of our community. I think that's one of the things that is tricky about being a nonprofit in today's landscape. There's a lot of nonprofits. Um, and we're all depending on philanthropy, and philanthropy is kind of like taking this downturn. And so, really kind of also educating communities about philanthropy and it's important. I think it's also like partially open hardware or open source work, right? Because we're all kind of in the same boat of having nonprofits. But yeah, that's how you become a member. I can see the um, equivalents in the legal side, it's having, having the license and something, but I had a hard time seeing how. Uh, the community would work on hardware. Uh, if, if you look at the software, versions get out on a daily basis because things get merged. But how would it work in hardware? Yeah. Yes. You, so there's a couple things you're absolutely right about. Um, so hardware moves a lot slower, right? And like if we're creating, you know, five different versions and shipping every single one of those versions in the same week. Really expensive, right? We can't really do that. So yeah, you you definitely need a much more stable version that you are going to be okay moving with and fixing <laughs> for like the next five years. You know, um, usually hardware has about 12 weeks until it gets hot copy in the open hardware realm. Um, but you know, it's really interesting. I love asking this question to people. How many people have ever buy something that you send on like that? Ah, no, I've never, I never ask that question all the time. Never got anybody raising it, right? We buy things on like color, size, if they have tech support, where they are, how 
fast you can get it, right? And so like, so it, it turns out that then the hardware gets copied. It doesn't necessarily mean that like everybody who goes and flocks to the new hardware that is like copy, right? We have lots of businesses and companies that can compete, no problem, um, having their hardware copy every 12 weeks. Um, but I would say like it's a, it's more of like a 12 week cycle, right? Before um, you wanna you wanna build your thing, or in, in a lot of cases it's actually longer than that. But if you have a good solid piece of hardware that people want, right? And it's kind of beautiful because people will um, will copy it for a totally different part of the world that was never gonna get an original company's uh, original clientele. They don't even speak the language. They don't even like understand the culture, right? So um, so it's kind of like okay, that's cool. If it's copyright, but they got absolutely much longer time period. What was the first question again about licensing? No, the, the, the question is with licenses. Oh, okay. But the, the building community having a. Oh, right, the community building. Yes, okay, yeah, this, this is really interesting. So, yeah, so the question was like, you know, the, the building of the community, right, with software that makes a lot of sense. You all know how to do that. With hardware, how does that work, right? And so with hardware, a lot of how that works is kind of on forums with users saying, like, hey, I want this feature. Hey, why don't you get this feature? And it's like totally like pull requests and whatnot, and like lots of projects from GitHub. The problem is like you can't always see exactly how the hardware schematic has changed at GitHub, or we don't have that layer of, of software available to us. Yet I think though, I think, I think he can make it in there. Um, but um, the um, the communities kind of also can rally around um, specific projects sometimes. So there's this really cool um, lab called the Not Impossible Lab that, that um, creates open hardware where a bunch of engineers get together and say, okay, we're going to try to solve this problem for us at Puff Mass. Right? And it's usually like, you know, humanitarian sort of, um, sort of reasons. Um, there's also places like what well, we rely on a lot more with our communities, more so of distributed manufacturing. Right? So, for example, field ready. Um, this is my, this is like a very, I don't totally understand what doctors do about what do, but like, this is like, you know, a crude ex understanding of that, but like, I think what Field Learner does is they are basically doctors without orders, and they have three things around their back, right? So they go into places who are, um, have, have natural disaster, who are war torn, who don't have the resources, um, to have all the various hardware that should be available to everybody. Um, for example, a bill go to class. Right? If you are in an area and you have no umbilical cord clamps and you've got people having babies, probably a 3D printed umbilical cord clamp is better than no umbilical cord clamp. Right? And so in that sense, you've got all these doctors who are going and, and creating sort of these, these umbilical cord clamps through 3D printing um, in this kind of distributed manufacturing sense. Right, so the open hardware allows anybody to manufacture, to distribute it, um, and that allows a whole bunch of more places to have a little hooker clamp who didn't have them to be under at that time. Yeah? Hi. Yeah, one of your comments uh, was about the idea that um, more cor corporations are uh, kind of owning the, or, or contributing the you know, single, single Company right. Whereas, uh, and I think you, you contrast that with the software situation and saying the foundation is doing that. Actually, that's not quite true. I, mean, I think what, that is true probably in some cases, but in a lot of our projects, um, it's still corporations, but there are just lots of them. And so, one of the things that like, the passion is really concerned about is whether a project might be captured by a single corporation rather than having contributors from many different places, individuals, corporations, etc. Um, and I, I, I'm just trying to understand like, how that difference plays out. Like, I, I, I don't, like, why is it a problem for you that a single corporation is like only, essentially the only one maintaining the project? I mean, or are there projects where you actually have contributions from many different entities and they're kind of sharing ideas in the community that's so related to the previous ones? Right, Ooh. So I think that that's um, interesting to hear like there's this concern about the corporation passion projects. Because you all feed into the same code base, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that it's, I mean, yeah, it, on some levels, actually not really different, right? Because, um, so I guess like, the difference would be like, 
if you need two different companies, company A, company B, in open hardware, both build in open hardware devices, maybe both with the contributing um, effectively to the same open hardware device, just created derivatives back and forth. And we've seen these happen a lot, um, where yeah, one company will build something, and another company will build the same thing but add a feature. And another company will build the same thing, and then add another feature, and then the other company will like lower the price. And then the other company will like, you know, respond. And then the other company will stop selling the thing because it turns out that nobody actually wanted it in their market anyway. Right? And so like we see like, you know, again, we see that like business problems are business problems are business problems, right? It's like a lot of the times um, there's uh, people are making business decisions that don't necessarily have to do with like the fact that something's written in or the fact that like it's open forever. Um, but yeah, and, and I don't think that's the thing that I don't think like necessarily like, a problem for any of these companies, right? They're just kind of like in their own world doing their own thing. And yes, they care about the community and they care about the ways in which the community is um, giving them feedback and, and making the product out of the code that they seem to open source. Um, but at the end of the day, like, they are a company who cares about you know, their bottom line, who needs to pay their people because their people have mortgages and need insurance and like, you know, all those other things that you have to worry about um, on the business side of things. Um, but, you know, it's like, when I think of like, all the different business problems, I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I have to like, set up 501Ks or 401Ks for, um, for, for, for my employees, and I have to do you know, this and that, whatever. Like, that's the, that's the company level, and I think, right, in, in hardware, the person making the hardware is the same person who has to figure out all the various insurance and employment and, and hiring. I don't know, like, does that work that way in software like, where you're all coming to the code base? It's not necessarily Apache's needing to get your insurance for you or needing to, like, you know, figure out all the business problems. I think, like, that is kind of the main difference I'm trying to teach that. But, like, again, tell me if I'm not going to be true. Okay, we have time for one more question. Yeah, good morning. Um, I'd like to get your thoughts on liability. Um, you talking about that medical equipment. Yeah. Do you see that being a hot Yes, yes. Liability is a huge hot topic in medical equipment. And actually, even in the electronics industry, when they were first starting out with open hardware, everybody was really nervous about liability. Um, because they thought, oh, what if like my device, they plug it in and it burns their house down and catches on fire or whatever, right? Um, and so, and, and like, you know, I mean, that's not something that like we need to hear about, like happening with open hardware all the time, right? It doesn't burn your house down. Um, so in the electronics field, right, we kind of recognize that like, oh, we were all really nervous about the liability. It turns out that it's not really a concern with the medical industry. I'm sure that it's much more of a concern. Um, but what my question kind of back to you is, does the source and how it's released matter for the liability, right? Because a closed source heart defibrillator can stop working and or can now function, right? Just as well as an open source one can. Um, there's liability to everything. And at the end of the day, no matter what your source is, doesn't stop you from getting sued because we live in America. <laughs> um, and America is love our legal system, love keeping it alive. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, when you think about liability, like, a lot of it is the terminology and the expectations you put around your hardware. So in the electronics industry, they started saying, like, you know, warranty as is, right? It's sold as is, and that's, that's the risk that you take on as a consumer. Um, I would imagine if somebody has an as is, maybe medical device, probably a lot of people might not want to use it. Um, but if they have one of these medical devices that has been through the FDA, the FDA, it turns out, does not actually care about what you do with your source. So they don't care if it's open or closed. That's really, like, they're like, yeah, we're not in that business, right, of caring about that. Um, they just want to make sure that you're thinking about risk analysis, that you've got a quality device, um, that kind of thing. So I think, like, liability absolutely will be out there. And I think there's a lot of education about what source really means, right? And it's really just the IP layer. Um, and, and, and yeah, but we're gonna absolutely find out 
how much liability plays into open source hardware medical devices. I would love to talk more about it as well, like if anybody has other thoughts, either about how to couch those liabilities, how to educate about those liabilities, what are the expectations we should have about liabilities, um, all that would be really interesting to me. Thank you for that question. And thank you very much yeah. for your thank you. and your Q&A today. Everybody, please, please take time.